Well, good morning, Crossbridge. If this is your first time here, thank you for making us a part of your Sunday. I'm Wendy Wood. I serve as the elementary director and one of the coordinators for the singles group here at Crossbridge. Crossbridge exists to make growing followers of Jesus Christ that know God, grow intentionally, and make a difference. And we want to help you take your next step, whatever that may be. So for the best way to start is by introducing yourself at our first time guest tent, which is found out front of the building, and we have a free gift for you. You can also use the Connect card, which is either in the seat back in front of you or under your chair, depending on where you're sitting, or you can use the helpful QR code. Today, right after our second service, we have our Next Steps lunch, and you can join Pastor Chuck and his wife Kathleen after our second service. They'll have lunch there. You get to learn more about your next step and getting connected at Crossbridge, and you can sign up for the lunch using the QR code on the back of the seats uh, found around the room, or since it's today, you can just show up. For all of you who are married, engaged, or seriously dating, we have date night coming up. This is going to be an evening of so much fun. There'll be desserts, giveaways, an encouraging message, some helpful takeaways from Pastor Chuck and his wife, Kathleen. The cost is only $25 per couple, and that covers desserts and all the materials Child care is available, and you can sign up for that event using the events page QR code, which is on the back of all the seats. For those like myself who are not married, engaged, or seriously dating, Crossbridge has a singles group, and our next event is a Super Bowl watch party here at the church next Sunday night. We'd love to have you come. You can also sign up for that on the events page which you can access using the QR code on the back of the chair. There's a theme. You see the theme? So, <laughs> this morning, we are continuing our new message series, Chasing the Wind. So will you please stand now for the reading of God's word? And today's reading comes from Ecclesiastes 2, 10 through 11. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Wendy Wood. I don't know if you know that about Dr. Wendy Wood there. So she would introduce herself that way, but we can do that. Well, it's great to see you this morning. If you're new, my name's Chuck, and I get to serve here as the lead pastor. And as Wendy said, uh, if you're new and you're looking to get connected, uh, this is a great Sunday to be here because we're having our next steps lunch. And my wife, Kathleen, and I would love to meet you if we haven't met yet. And we'll spend about an hour together, and we'll just tell you a little about the church, how you can get connected, what some next steps for you might be. So I'd love to see you there. Uh, I'd love for you to just sign up or show up. If you have kids and you want them taken care of in child care, it's best just to stop either by the kids' check-in table or, like she said, use that QR code and sign up so we, we just have uh, know you're, you're coming. Uh, let's pray together and then we'll dive into the message. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you that we know how the story ends. The story ends with you and your people being together forever. And that we are fighting the battles that we're fighting, Lord, in the end, um, when Jesus rose from the dead, victory was proclaimed. Sin doesn't have to have the last word. Death doesn't have to have the last word. Suffering doesn't have to have the last word. Jesus, you have the last word. And so we are a people of hope in that. And so as a people of hope, we want to grow in that. We want to learn more about you, Lord, and your way. So we sit under your word now. We ask that by your spirit, you would speak to us today. Help us be aware of your presence today. Make your presence tangible to us today. We need you. We don't just need to hear words of people. We don't just need to sit through religious service. We need encounters with you. 
We need your spirit working in us, drawing us close to you. So say something now to us. Speak to us. Our hearts are open. Help us to hear your voice, to believe what your word says, and to live it out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the years, through all kinds of experiments, we've, you know, it, it discovered amazing things. We've discovered cure for diseases. We've discovered great inventions uh, all throughout uh, the history of humanity. But also, there have been experiments that have gone not so well. We've tested theories, and that theory didn't work, and, and that just was kind of frustrating. Or we've tested theories and experiments, and they've had terrible results, sometimes very funny results, sometimes tragic results, sometimes frustrating results. Uh, but when experience, you can waste a lot of time just Googling experiments gone wrong, and you can just fall down that rabbit hole and read all about them. Uh, I'll give you a couple that have gone uh, wrong over the years. This is a picture of a guy named uh, Frank Reihelt, and uh, it's taken in 1912. He is wearing what he, is, what he calls his aviator suit, which is basically a suit of clothes that transforms into a parachute. Okay, and so he had been testing it for years with not much success. He would put uh, dummies in the suit and throw it off cliffs, throw it off two-story buildings, and it would just never open. But finally, he thinks he's perfected it, so he is going to do a demonstration by throwing the suit off with the dummy off the Eiffel Tower. At the last moment, though, Frank says, I so want to show the worth of this invention. I'm going to wear it myself. This is a photograph taken right before he dies. He jumps to his death. Yeah, so that experiment did not go so well for Frank. Now, that's a tragic result. In 2014, McDonald's um, wanted to offer healthier food options for children. So they put an experiment together and came up with bubblegum flavored broccoli. It's a true story. This is not an urban legend. They had this, they tried it out. And as you know, that did not make it to market because it was disgusting. They found out not so tragic, a little bit more uh, humorous there. Well, today we're going to look at and continue our series, Chasing the Wind. And we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to see some experiments that the preacher kind of our main character taking us on this journey through Ecclesiastes, some experiments he did in trying to figure out what life's all about. Where's the substance of life? Where's the meaning of life? Where, what's the good life all about? And he's going to conduct some experiments. So if you have a Bible, would you open up with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2? We're on page 553 in the Bible's under your chair. We started this series last week, and we learned that Ecclesiastes is really not like any other book in the Bible. It's really different. It's not like a story or like a statements of doctrine. It's this, this journey that this character, the preacher, or you might think of him as a professor. You might think of him as a teacher. In the Hebrew, it's koeleth. And it's just, he's taking us on this journey. And so he's, he's showing you like what he's done and his thoughts. And, his, and he's a frustrated guy because he's finding that life here, here on planet Earth, what he calls under the sun, it's really hard to find how to grab hold of meaning. And so he, he started last week and telling us all this. And I kind of feel like I needed to check on everybody when it was over because, you know, that guy, it was pretty down last week, you know, uh, but he's just getting started. So um, today he's going to talk about some more experiments he did. Here's some experiments I did in trying to find out what the meaning of life is. And so we're going to walk through these together. Chapter two, verse one. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. So test, he's going to experiment. And he says, I'm going to test you with pleasure. But behold, this was also vanity. Now, if you weren't here last week, vanity uh, he talks about, he'll say the word vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. And what he means by that, some translations will put meaningless, but it's the idea, it's the Hebrew word hebel, and it's the idea of smoke. It's the idea of, I see it, I can smell it, there's substance to it, it feels like, but I can't get my hands around it. Um, Friday, I was driving my daughter to school, uh, going down 59, and there was this like wall in front of me. But that wall had no substance because it was fog and I could just drive through it. That's hebel. So he's saying that as I experiment, I find out these things are just fog. It's just smoke. It's just mist. It's just, it's something I see. It's something I think I can touch. It's something I think I'm going to run into, but there's nothing to it here. So experiment number one, 
chasing pleasure. This is his first experiment, chasing pleasure. And let's, let's look and see what he did. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with my wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Now, you got to remember, and you're, last week is kind of probably hard to see, but this week we'll start to see it. Uh, the preacher is not a pessimist. He's not an atheist, but he is frustrated by how life is here on earth under the sun. He's frustrated with that. And so he's saying, I'm going to experiment now by finding out pleasure. So what I found is that laughter, he goes, he says right there in verse, if you go back to verse two, he says, it's mad. Now, does that mean laughter is bad? No. He's just saying, you can't laugh at everything. Not everything's funny. If everything's a joke to you, you're missing out on life. You're missing something if everything's a joke for you. It's not, it's not all laughter. It's great to laugh. I mean, the Proverbs will say a merry heart, it works like a medicine. And now science will come back and say, hey, laughter is actually good for you. Backing up what the Bible says, you know, surprise and, and all that. But you see, you can't laugh at everything. Not everything's funny. Laughter isn't the meaning of life. This is what he means by it's mad. You can't, it, it looks good, it feels good, but it has no substance. In fact, you, you read tragic stories of comedians. In fact, I, I've, you know, never known a comedian that I've read about or heard about that doesn't have tragedy in their background. And so many have struggled with depression. And sadly, some have even ended their life. And you think, oh, but they're funny. They see life lightheartedly. Well, sure, they're funny. They enjoy laughter. They enjoy making people laugh. But that's not the meaning of life. They can't, that's, that's hebel, that's vanity for them. So he says, well, I'm going I'm to investigate wine. And now you notice he says there, he says, you know, my heart's still guiding me with wisdom, which means like, I'm not going to go crazy with it. I'm not just going to go like on a bender and just get drunk out of my mind all the time, but I am going to pursue the pleasure of that. I'm trying to figure out what the good life is by chasing pleasure. So he keeps going. Verse four, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Now, we said last week the preacher never identifies himself. In fact, he's in first person sometimes. Sometimes he's referred to in third person. So most likely, even though the preacher's the main character of Ecclesiastes, he may not be the author. And a lot of people like wonder and, and different keys and tools and kind of clues of who the preacher is. Is he, many think, King Solomon, the son of King David, who was known as the richest, wisest man to ever live? Maybe. It never says, though. So we have to be careful drawing conclusions and from the scripture. The scripture actually doesn't put there. But if it is Solomon, there are some clues here that it could be. Because those clues are what he built. These magnificent houses, these vineyards, these gardens, these fruit trees, these pools, and all of these things. I mean, Solomon built stuff that just blew people away. People would come from overseas, see what he did, and be like, just like blown away by what he built. He built the temple the first temple in Jerusalem. Then his own palace he built, which took 13 years and was bigger than the temple. He built houses for his wives and he had hundreds of wives. So basically he's saying, you know, I get it. You might be a little handy guy too. You might have built yourself a back, uh, you know, a back shed. You might have an herb garden. You might be really impressive on Minecraft, but you stink compared to me. I built things that just blow you away. He even, he even built irrigation systems, some which you can find today, that are still there today. Now, it's interesting. In verse 5, he says, he planted in the gar gardens all kinds of fruit trees. Now, I don't know if you write in your Bible. If this isn't your Bible you're looking at, don't write in it. But, um, but you might make a note of that phrase. All kinds of fruit trees. Because that's going to give us a clue is, what is he really after? What's he really chasing here? What's he really trying to build? Because this phrase appears three more times in another book in the Old Testament. But we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Then verse 7, I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of, of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Now, 
you might just be kind of offended by these two verses, and rightfully so. Because worst case scenario, this guy's just, he's just let himself go. I mean, slaves, it, it, depending on the context of the different, of, of where this happened and who it happened with and what it happened, a slave can be anything of what the worst you think of about slavery to someone who just owes you money and it's not like you're a bank for a loan. They're working for you to pay off a debt and they're like an employee. But here it doesn't say. And if it is Solomon, it sadly probably is the fact that he owns people. That's worst case scenario. He actually owns them. Best case scenario, he has a lot of employees, a lot of people that owe him money that are working for him. No matter what, he just has a lot of people under him. He has power. He has the pleasure of power. People who do what he says all day. He's flexing his wealth. I've got these possessions more than any who have been behind me in Jerusalem. I've got silver, gold, the treasures of kings and provinces. I, I got singers. And when he says singers, both men and women, he doesn't mean just like people who are standing, you know, like a little choir over there. He's like top-notch performance. I mean, I know, you, you, you know, you're kind of blown away. You had floor tickets for Taylor Swift and you were just like, it was amazing. He's like, Taylor Swift does my house shows. You're pretty much like second fiddle. Small potatoes. And then he says, he talks about concubines. And that's exactly what you think it is. That he has all these women. If he's Solomon, he has 700 wives and 300 concubines. For the purpose of just sexual pleasure. He's like, you think you've built stuff? i built more. You think you have money? I have more. You think you've been to great entertainment and can afford great stuff? I can do more. You think you've had great mind-blowing pleasure? I've had more. Anything you have, he is the song. Anything you can do, I've done better. He just comes back at it more and more. So verse 9, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. I still, I didn't go out of my mind. I didn't lose my mind in all this. And, and he kind of sums up his pursuit of pleasure. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for pleasure. And for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. No one surpassed him. And he's very honest. He actually enjoyed himself in the midst of this. Sometimes Christians aren't very honest about the fact that sin, we talk about sin like it's not enjoyable. That's one of the reasons we sin. It feels good for a moment. It satisfies for an instant. It gives us a dopamine hit. He's saying all the stuff that, hey, I deprived myself of nothing. And I actually had a good time. But he still says, it's vanity. Because he said he had the most success, the best houses, the most possessions, the richest lifestyles, the most sophistication, the finest wines, the most incredible parties and feasts, the greenest lawns, the best servants, more money than we could possibly imagine, military fame, popularity, inter endless entertainment, and as much sexual pleasure as anyone can indulge in. And then what was his conclusion? Besides, I did enjoy some of it. Verse 11. Then I considered all my hands had done and the toil I expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. All that. And he says it's hebel, vanity. It's like chasing the wind. And there's nothing to be gained. And I didn't find out what the meaning of life is here on earth. I couldn't find it. And I deprived myself of nothing. And there were things that I enjoyed about it. But it wasn't. It didn't have any substance. It didn't have any lasting value. There was nothing to be gained. And you got to ask yourself the question, what are you chasing that you think will bring you pleasure? I mean, how would you answer this question? I will be happy when? I will be happy when? I'll be happy when, you know, I get a promotion. I get a raise. We can get that bigger house. We can get that house sold. I'll be happy when, and maybe it's more serious than that, my loved one or, or I'm cancer-free. I'll be happy when my kids are out of the house. I'll be happy when we can have kids. What would you fill in the blank with? 
And it's not that that's not a legitimate desire. That's not what the, the preacher is saying to us. What the preacher is saying here in his angst is, fill in the blank with whatever. You probably will get some enjoyment out of it. But it will be that nothing will be gained in finding your meaning on earth. It'll be like you trying to grab fog. It'll be like you trying to grab smoke. It won't really deliver. So his experiment was chasing pleasure. Here's his findings. Chasing pleasure is like chasing the wind. Chasing pleasure is like chasing the wind. So he moves on. Experiment number two, chasing wisdom. Chasing wisdom. Verse 12. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has been already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness, which basically he's saying it's better to be wise than to be foolish. That's, that's just better in life. He's being very honest. You do foolish things, probably foolish things are going to happen to you, bad things are going to happen to you, bad consequences. You do some wise things, and wisdom is not just knowledge. Wisdom is knowing how to apply knowledge. It's not just being an expert on certain things and topics in your head. It's being a practitioner as well, knowing how to apply the right thing at the right time. He's saying that's better than folly. That, that, it's, it's, it's just like light is better than darkness. Verse 14, the wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Well, what is that event? They die. Remember, he's going to keep talking about death. He talked about death last week. The life is hard and then you die. He's not going to leave, he's not going to leave that. The life under the sun is hard and then you die. Wise people die. Foolish people die. The wisest person you know, the smartest people you know, they die. The foolish person dies. The foolish person might die because... You know, you ever you ever seen that um, that app or that game? Um, my kid, my my kids used to show it to me. It's called Dumb Ways to Die, and it was just like basically trying to promote safety by showing this like little creature, you know, doing things you shouldn't do, like grabbing on to uh, you know high electrical wires and stepping in front of trains. It was like and it had a little catchy song, but it was all about don't do this, kids. It's like what what is this website? Foolish people die, but wise people die too. And then, verse 15, then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this is also vanity. He's like, if the fool dies and I die, what, what's the point of wisdom? What, what am I doing here? For Six, verse 16, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten how the wise dies just like the fool. There's a lot of wise people that have lived. Maybe we can name some of them. We can't name all of them. They, the wise come and the wise go. So verse 17, he's not in a good place here. So I hated life because what is done in the sun was grievous to me. He's upset. He's frustrated. He's not hated life like he's depressed. He's, he's so angsty. He's angsty because, well, I don't get the point. I can be really wise, and that's, I guess, better than being foolish because I see these other good things happen to me. But in the end, wise or fools, we, we meet the same end. I, I, I can't seem to grasp what's going on. I can't seem to grasp the meaning here. And you think about it. All the wisdom we have out there. We, we mentioned this last week. All the information that's available for you on your phones, in your pockets or purses right now. That we could, if we actually applied, we could be among the wisest people that's ever lived in the history of humanity. And the preacher would say, yeah, but you're still going to die. What's the point of all that? And he's asking a hard question and he expects us to think about it. He doesn't expect us to go, what's the point? I'm just depressed. No, no. If that's where you go, you're missing what the preacher's trying to tell you here. He's trying to say, no, think about this. What, what is the point of all that you know and all that you're living out? What's the meaning behind it all? Why do you do what you do and call it wise? What does that really benefit you? What's your goal? What's your end game? Because if it is just, well, I'm better than the fool. Okay, great. I agree, but you're still going to die. 
So what's his conclusion? Chasing wisdom is like chasing the wind. Chasing wisdom is like chasing the wind. And then his third and final experiment, chasing work. Chasing work. Verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be a master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to build this thing for him. It's this like culture he's built, all these things. And then someone's going to inherit it. And what if they blow it? I'm going to build a company and I'm going to hand it off to my successor and the company could go bankrupt pretty quickly. They could just destroy the whole thing. I'm going to, what do I have to show for my work? Because it could be here today and gone tomorrow. So verse 20, so I turned about and gave my heart up to despair. He's really like, he's not like, it's like if you said, are you good? He'd be like, no, not today. I'm not good. Not good at all. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. And you read stories. Guy starts a great organization, great company, hands it off to a successor. Maybe it's his kid. Maybe it's someone else. And it just goes down. It just doesn't have the same thing with it. It takes years before they can rebound and build. It just, it's, it's just like, oh, this is just, it's, it's a great. He's like, it's not even just vanity. It's just wrong. It's evil. What has a man from all, this is verse 22, a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils under the sun. For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. I mean, dude, man, this guy, you know, is just like, he, he just needs like, I don't know. I mean, does he need a cookie, a puppy? He didn't say anything about puppies. I mean, he needs something. Maybe a kitty, uh, some, uh, horseback ride, something, man. Go see nature. I mean, gosh, man, you're, you're really looking at the dark side. And he's like, I know. I'm, ask, I'm, not, I'm not content with pat answers. I'm, I did not deprive my heart of any pleasure. I went fully after wisdom. I've done all this work. And again, all I find is smoke. I mean, the preacher might make you depressed. You might think he's a downer. You might think like, this guy's got problems. But he ain't lying. He's being honest. Life here is hard. He ain't telling lies. And God put this in the Bible. So he, God is saying through us in this text, through the preacher, hey, life under the sun, life here on earth, it's frustrating. It's hard. It's challenging, perplexing. That Christianity and the faith of the scripture is not about easy answers. It wants to actually push hard into areas where we feel pain and say, no, let's, let's go there. And let's ask really hard questions because there's something behind the question we want to get to. And you think of this moment of all that he worked for and all they go after. I mean, you just read story after story that people have accomplished great things and they wondered if it was worth it. Tom Brady, seven-time Super Bowl champion. After he wins his third Super Bowl, CBS interviews him. And here's what he says. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reach my goal, my dream, my life. I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I, I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I love playing football. I love being quarterback for this team. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. You got to wonder what he would say today. More victory, more, I mean, more than anyone. What he's done, which is pretty amazing. Whether you like him or not, doesn't matter. Like seeing the other 46-year-olds in the room go out and 
didn't hang with him. That ain't going to happen. At least any 36-year-olds hang with him. That ain't going to happen. But everybody has a Super Bowl ring. Eventually going to die, and it's going to be donated to a museum. Their kid's going to get it, and they're going to sell it. Or they're going to be buried with it. And now it's just under dirt in a box. So Tom Brady, what he's, what he's saying here back then, is he's saying that, I got, I got it. I, I got it more than once. This can't be it. He's, a, the preacher would go, that guy gets it. And the preacher would say, let's dig into that answer. What's behind all that? So experiment number three, chasing work. What's the, what's the finding? Chasing work is like chasing the wind. So if you take all of his experiments, his pleasure seeking, his wisdom seeking, his seeking to find meaning in his work, he's searching for meaning, he's searching for purpose, he's searching for his ultimate identity. What is the ultimate findings of his experiment? Will this be the chute that opens for me that can carry my life when I jump off the Eiffel Tower? He would say, no, none of these suits will open. None of these suits will open. His experiment findings are that chasing the good life apart from God is chasing the wind. Because you notice there was hardly any mention of God in these texts. In fact, I don't necessarily think there was one in, the, in everything we read. He just said he went after pleasure. He just said he went after wisdom. And I know that probably bothers some of you, especially if you know the Bible somewhat, but you're like, well, we have Proverbs and wisdom's good. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God is what the writer, the writer of Proverbs says. Yes, that's true. But you notice he didn't talk about that kind of wisdom. He was just talking about general wisdom. So now he's going to take a turn and it's a startling turn. You're going to think this guy does need help with this turn because look what he says in verse 24. There is nothing better. For a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he's given the business of gathering, collecting, only to give the one who pleases God. And this is also vanity and a striving after wind. You're like, what is wrong with this guy? What was happening here? He's like, listen. Pursue all of that. But if you're looking to find the meaning in all of that, it's hebel. It's smoke. It's driving through fog. It's flying through a cloud. It's trying to, to grab a scent. You can't grab a scent. He said, but here's the thing. You should enjoy life as a gift from God. You, everything, he says, from the hand of God. And look, apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? In fact, to find real joy... In our time here under the sun, you got to be rightly connected to God. You got to be rightly connected to Him. In fact, the one who pleases God, man, that's, that's the aim of life. He's going he's gonna to bless you, He's going to be leading you, and, and your end is great. In fact, the, the sinner who's been about trying to live life and not try to live a life pleasing to God, not trying to worship God, not trying to love God, he's just going to get all this stuff, and it's fine, it's just going to be given away and scattered. So his life is vanity and striving after the wind. So what do we do with this? You know, if, we, if these things aren't the meaning of life, then what do you do with these things? Well, the writer tells us this. Enjoy your life as a gift from God. Enjoy your life as a gift from God. Three times in the book of Ecclesiastes, he will tell us to enjoy our lives. He's not a kill, God's not a killjoy. God didn't invent all these pleasures in life, these wonderful tastes and textures and touches and sensations and sights to see and abilities we've been given and, and things we can learn, apply and, and, and things we can accomplish. He didn't do all that just to go, well, that's all meaningless. It is apart from him. It is if you try to find the meaning of life from the gift. That's where it ends up meaningless. But if you try to find the meaning of life with the giver, and you just enjoy the gift from him in the ways that he talks about. Obviously, there's stuff here in Ecclesiastes 2. He's not, the, the, the scripture's not condoning sin here with the life of the preacher. He's just telling you, it's just telling you what the preacher went after. 
Obviously, all these things are understood under God's laws and God's ways. But he's saying, enjoy, though, what God's given you. If you make the gift your God, it's your source of meaning, your source of identity, your source of purpose of life, you'll find the gifts enjoyable, but they're never enough. It might smell good and taste good and feel good and sound good and look good, but it's going to be like grabbing smoke if you don't enjoy your life as a gift from God. Everything is vanity without God. But with God, we can actually enjoy the gifts he's given us as what they are, temporary gifts, moments of his kindness, moments of his goodness. So yesterday, maybe you had a great day. Maybe you built a pillow fort with your kids and just laughed until you cried. Thank God for that. You try to hold on to that as the meaning of your life, it's smoke. It, you, you have a new baby and you love the way they smell most of the time and um, the way they feel and you ride and it's like, oh, this is so amazing. Enjoy that as a gift. Be fully present and thank God for his blessing. You try to hold on to that, it's smoke. They'll be bigger before you know it. They won't want you to hold. They'll be trying to get down. They'll be trying to walk. They'll drive off. They'll leave. It's smoke. Enjoy the moments as a gift. There's nothing better, he says. And what he means by that is there really is nothing better than to see life as a gift. And the moment you have right now, it's the only moment you have. And so see it that God said, you're making wise choices and life's working out for you. That's a gift from God. Enjoy that. Thank him for that. Don't seek your meaning in that. You're highly successful in your business. That's awesome. Thank God for that. Ask him what's his agenda for that. Don't try to make that the giver. When you try to make these things the giver of meaning, it's vanity and a striving after the wind. But in the midst of all this, what he's not saying here is this. So I can still enjoy all the good stuff. I just got to make sure I'm thanking God, right? I'm just adding God to my already all my selfish whims. I'm just adding God to the way I do life. No, that's not what he's saying. And it's not what the story of Scripture tells us. We don't read Ecclesiastes. We don't rip it out and read it outside of the whole Bible. We read it in the middle of the Bible. So what does it tell us? Well, I think C.S. Lewis helps us with this. C.S. Lewis has this quote. He says this, Most people, if they, really, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know they do not want and want acutely something that can be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. And then he says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. He's saying here, what is the ache? What is it you're really searching for? Enjoy life as a gift, but what, it, it, you stop that and you say, thank God. Well, okay, wait, pause for a moment. He wants you to relate to God, the preacher here is saying. Because our friend C.S. Lewis here would say, probably what you're looking for in pleasure and all those things you've drank, all those things you smoked, all those things you ate, all those people you've been with, all those business, all those things you endeavors you went after, all the things you bought and built and put your hand toward. If you did that to find meaning, you're looking for something. And C.S. Lewis says, you're not going to find it in that, even though it may promise that, even though we built our whole, like, you know, lives and consumer society around that things deliver, it can't deliver can't deliver. And what we're searching for is something other than this world. The preacher was looking for that too. Because what was he really trying to build? He was building all these things. He deprived himself of no pleasure. And remember, he built himself a garden. And it said that I made myself gardens, verse 5, and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. There's another passage in the Old Testament where it says someone made a garden and there were all kinds of fruit trees pleasing to eat. And in that garden, 
he placed a man and a woman. And he said, you have dominion. Be fruitful and multiply. You're free to eat of any tree of the, in this garden except this one. He gave him freedom. He gave him pleasure. He gave him work. There was no plants yet because Genesis tells us there was no one to work the ground. So meaningful work, cultivating civilization and culture, humanity. What's the preacher trying to build? Eden. He's trying to get back home. He's trying to connect with an ache he can't find the, the meaning for. He's trying to remember a song that he knows the tune for, but he can't remember the lyric. He remembers the actor, but he doesn't know what movie he was in. He knows the destination and the signs, but the scenery's different now, and he can't remember how to get there. It's what we're all looking for. But what we try to do and how we've built culture now is Eden without God. We want his kingdom, but we don't want the king. And the preacher says, and that's a striving after the wind. That's like grabbing smoke. That's vanity. And the reason we can't get back there, friends, is because the scripture says we're separated from God. We're estranged from God. We're enmity with God because we, we broke his rule. We rejected him. We said, you really don't know what's best. I'm not going to deprive myself of anything, even the forbidden fruit. And so with humanity's rejection of God, sin entered the world. Sin entered us. And the world is cursed. The world is like chasing the wind now. And everyone's going to die unless Jesus returns. And so we're in this now life stage under the sun where we keep, we keep exercising some of the things that God told us to do. We keep having dominion. We keep building culture. We keep building civilization. We keep having all these incredible th breakthroughs and technology and mess and all that. But we keep chasing after the wind and we can't seem to stop war. We can't seem to stop hunger. We can't seem to stop the ache in the human heart to want to have power over people. We can't seem to say, here's the one way to have sexuality that's just going to be satisfying for everyone. Everybody will be okay because we, we keep seeking like different different ways to you know, make up stuff that's like, well, now what about this and what about that? We can't seem to get back. We're striving after the wind. And the writers of Scripture say, it's because we're separated from God. And the only way for us to, to, to be reconnected with God is for God to come to us. God to come to us. And he came to us in the person of Jesus. And remember what Jesus said about himself? He said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to know the way to meaning? You want to know the truth about your purpose? You want to know the life that is truly life? It's through me. You got to follow me. I'll show you what life is like when you live under his loving rule. And all the stuff, all the sin you've given yourself to, all the ways you've pursued pleasure and wisdom and work that did not honor God and was all about fulfilling you and making you feel like a God, I'm going to die in your place for. I'm going to pay the penalty for. I'm going to take your punishment. So we have to come to Jesus. This story, the preacher, he's setting up something that's not going to be satisfied completely till we get to Jesus who's come to say, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. He wants to show you that you can still experience the true, the beautiful, and the good of the world. But it won't really have the meaning it's supposed to have until you're rightly connected to him. So if you chase the true, the beautiful, and the good, it's like grabbing the wind. It's like grabbing the wind. But if you come to Jesus... You will discover the true, the beautiful, and the good under God's loving rule. Because Jesus has begun and is right now and will one day complete the healing of the world. Making all things new. The renewal of all creation. Romans 8 says that creation's groaning with frustration. Everything we hear is the groan of, ah, it's like hebel. And what God has done is he's entered the world through the person of Jesus. He's saying you were made not just for this stuff. You were made for the giver of the stuff. And come rightly and be connected to the giver of life. By turning from your ways, turning from your wisdom, turning from seeking self-pleasure, turning from seeking your own self-wisdom. 
The Bible calls that repentance and give yourself to me. Surrender to me because he has begun and is doing and will complete the healing of the world. And right now, what's he doing? If you're a Christian, you believe in him. He's working in you. He's making you new and loving you and empowering you to be the lie of the world that when people say, it all just seems meaningless, we don't disagree. We know what you mean. I thought life was meaningless too. And then one day, not too long ago, God revealed to me my meaning was to be in right relationship with him through Jesus. And he's changed my life. My life's not perfect and life's still frustrating. But he's changed my life. Has anything like that ever happened to you? It puts us in a conversation with the world where we're not over them, pointing our finger. We're right alongside them going, life is frustrating. But there's another way, the way of Jesus, the person of Jesus. So what do we do with all this? Three, last three things. Number one, surrender to and spend a lot of time with Jesus. You need to surrender to Jesus, to his rule and his reign, to his lordship, to his leadership. So, you know, we're learning about him, the way of his kingdom. If you're not reading the gospels on a regular basis, go back and start reading the gospels. If you haven't read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, his Sermon on the Mount, go read that. What an incredible thing to read alongside Ecclesiastes. Because he's telling you what the, what the way of his kingdom is like. And the preacher's going, it doesn't work here. And Jesus is saying, well, come follow me. Come let me empower you and forgive you and give you my spirit and show you a different way to live. Surrender to and spend time with Jesus. Thank God for his gifts. Enjoy the life God's given you and thank him for his gifts. That's not a try answer. Gratitude changes everything. Gratitude to God is like it is a way to counterform yourself from the way the world is trying to conform you into a consu- an entitled consumer. Gratitude to God is a counterformation tool which says, I am not an entitled consumer. I'm a grateful child of the Father. And then thirdly and finally, be relentless with others. You should do this in community because we're very easily self-deceived in making sure the gifts stay in their lane. That means if a gift starts leaving the lane and starts becoming the meaning, it, you start thinking it's the giver rather than the gift. We need to be relentless about that. And just go, you know what? That is not going to bring me meaning and purpose. It is not going to give me the identity I was made for and longed for that can only be found in Jesus. And we need others around us. So when we start drifting, the gift starts leaving their lane and start, we start looking as a giver, a friend, a brother, a sister in Christ can say with us with all love and tenderness, hey, I've been there, but you know that's not going to give you what you want. It's going to be a good gift. I'm not down in it. But you can't, you're looking to that for too much. You're looking to your spouse for too much. You're going to crush them. They're going to disappoint you. You're looking to your kids for too much. You're going to crush them. They're going to disappoint you. You're looking for your job too much. If it goes well, it's going to go to your head and you're going to be arrogant. And if it goes bad, it's going to go to your heart and you're going to be despondent. It needs to stay in their lane. Come back to Jesus. Surrender to, spend time with him. Thank God for his gifts. Be relentless with others so the gifts stay in their lane. The preacher's not depressed. He's just saying, this is what happens when you pursue the gifts as the giver of meaning. It's meaningless. But if you can go back to the giver, be rightly connected to him through Jesus ultimately, And you can be grateful for the life God has given you. You'll find some joy, even though the world's still frustrating. Even though some of the things I've said still is true, he would say. But the point of life is under the sun, not just to live like everything is under the sun, but to live beyond the sun in relationship with our creator. Let's pray. Is there a gift from God that you've been looking at 
to be the giver of meaning and purpose and life for you lately? Is there a gift that's left its lane and you've gladly welcomed it? Why don't you just repent right now of that? Why don't you just tell the Lord, Lord, I've made this. I've made food. I've made drink. I've made this kind of pleasure. I've made my job. I've, I've made this. I've turned to this. I've turned to my phone and all the dopamine rush of that. I've turned to these things, God. When I should have turned to you. I'm sorry I made these gifts into something they weren't supposed to be. But you cleanse me now. Cleanse me by your spirit. Jesus, I freshly surrender to you now. And I open my heart to your love again. Maybe you've never met Jesus before. Maybe you've never come to him for life. And it starts by turning from your way of life, repenting from your way of life, changing your mind and changing your direction. It involves confessing your sin that you've sought life apart from him. You've sought meaning apart from him. It includes the things you've done and the things you've said, and the things you've taught, but mainly it's about your heart orientation away from him. Just confess that and say, I've sinned against you. I want to turn away from that now. I thank you that Jesus died on the cross paying for my sin. I don't, I don't have to pay you back now. I don't have to work to make you like me. You came to me. You love me. And Jesus paid the debt I could not pay. Thank you for rising from the dead, Jesus. I surrender my life now to you. Be my Lord. Be my leader. Be the lover of my soul. Be my meaning. Be my purpose. Why don't you just give yourself to him right now? Father, I thank you for Ecclesiastes chapter 2, brutally honest chapter about all the pursuits that we could go after. But without, without you, it's just like grabbing smoke, chasing the wind. But your word says, if we seek you, we'll find you. If we ask, it will be given. If we knock, it will be opened. So Lord, right now we come asking for you. Fill our hearts. We're seeking your love, your truth, your way. We're knocking to know more about who you are, to be our hearts filled more with the love of God, your Holy Spirit, to have our minds transformed. You're the meaning. You're the purpose. Come now, Holy Spirit. Draw us after Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a song in response. Our ushers are going to come. They're going to pass the offering bag. It's a time of worshiping and through giving. And it's what our church family does. If you're new with us, we'd just like to get that connect card that uh, Wendy talked to you about earlier. And if you missed the offering bag, there's uh, tall boxes around the building. You can drop your connect card in there. You can drop your offering in there. And we'd love to help you get connected. Let's uh, sing the song and I'll come back up and close our service.